So welcome to this overview about cannabis. Don't expect to learn everything about this complex group of medications in this video, and I'll be covering a lot of ground quite quickly by necessity. I'm grateful to those who assisted me in gaining expertise in the field, and I'm actually starting to feel like the man in this picture. Medicinal cannabis may actually be a true panacea, and pro-cannabinoid doctors risk sounding evangelistic thanks to the number and diversity of indications for its use chronic non-cancer pain and natural neuropathic pain, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, insomnia, epilepsy, MS spasticity, palliative care, emaciation and loss of appetite, poor gut motility, anxiety, PTSD, depression, migraine and Tourette's syndrome, give or take a few. But the cannabis as panacea claim is grounded in physiology in the endocannabinoid system, which was only discovered in the 1980s and early 1990s after a surge of interest that accompanied the HIV AIDS epidemic. Historically, cannabis has been used in multiple cultures and countries dating back thousands of years, and it was legally used until the early 20th century. And then things changed. Why? The story of how a relatively benign substance acquired such an evil reputation is far more about racial persecution and political suppression in 20th century America than it is about pharmacology or medicine. Harry Anslinger, a contemporary of John Edgar Hoover, who was the FBI director at the time, ran the Federal Bureau of Narcotics for decades and he fathered the war on drugs. Prior to the end of alcohol prohibition in 1933, via the 21st Amendment to the Constitution, Anslinger had claimed that cannabis was not a problem. Then his advice shifted, not due to objective evidence, but self-interest due to the obsolescence of the Department of Prohibition he headed when alcohol prohibition ceased. His view was clear, ideological and judgmental, just untrue. His campaign in the 1930s to demonize cannabis, rebranded marijuana for the Mexican connotations, began as a ploy to keep the then Department of Prohibition relevant, but was also useful in the repression of people of color, jazz musicians and other subversives. Close to a century later, Anslinger's legacy is visible in the relative sparseness of the science of cannabinoids as medicine, at least in the form of high quality randomized controlled trials that synthesize nicely into meta-analyses. The studies tend to be small, observational, heterogeneous, and to conflate therapeutic with recreational use. Cannabis is legal for medical use in 29 of the United States and for recreational use in another 11. Yet federally in the USA, cannabis is a Schedule One substance under the Controlled Substances Act 1970, alongside heroin, LSD and other hallucinogens, some synthetic opioids and the dangerous depressant gamma hydroxybutyrate, GHB. This category is reserved for drugs that have high potential for abuse, have no accepted medical use and are not safe to use even under medical supervision. Similarly, in Australia, medicinal cannabis is listed as an S8, along with the most dangerous opiates. That's despite cannabis having low dependency rates, an estimated 9% and literally no lethal dose, while legal opioids, Schedule II in USA, mainly fentanyl, are killing 130 Americans and three Australians every day. It was more than 47,000 Americans in 2017. Internationally, cannabis has been accepted in several countries, including Canada, USA and European countries. I took these holiday snaps recently in Zurich when we came out of the hotel to see this cafe where one can buy burgers, bongs and all sorts of cannabis products. It is now over two years since Canada fully legalized the sale and recreational use of marijuana in the country, joining only Uruguay as the second nation to do so. Australia is becoming more liberal, apart from Tasmania, at least now. However, there are still major problems. Dan's law was put in place to legalise the cultivation of medicinal cannabis in Australia. When the government passed the 2016 law legalising the use of medicinal cannabis, it had just one major aim, which was to make sure Australia complied with international drug treaties in order to protect this country's lucrative poppy straw trade. We supply over 50% of the world's raw materials used to make opioid medicines. Dan was just 25 when he died with terminal bowel cancer. 
His mother, Lucy, continues the campaign to make medicinal cannabis more available. As medicinal cannabis and other cannabis products still remain in a state of permanent regulatory limbo, they are quite literally approved, unapproved medicines. At least imported products became available in 2017 and Australian grown products became available in July 2018. The campaign for easier access to medicinal cannabis continues to be patient led, but it's time to fix Dan's law. And some myths. Cannabis was deemed a dangerous substance, although in the scale of lethal toxicity of psychoactive substances, it is actually the safest. Australian doctor in June 2019 published a list of the relative fatal toxicity indices. And the answer for the most lethal drug is opiates. Not surprisingly, cannabis doesn't even appear on the list. Opioids are perceived as strong analgesics with a lack of adequate alternatives but they may not actually be particularly effective in improving pain or function. And they do cause significant problems. Indeed, more deaths than heroin, not to mention side effects such as opioid fog, which is a clouding of thinking. Cannabis is a good alternative with better, if any, side effects, if you can afford it. Indeed, there have been no reported deaths from cannabis use as there are no cannabis receptors in the brain stem, which controls breathing. It is opioid receptors in the brainstem that stop breathing during an opiate overdose. People are also worried about the risk of dependence. Heroin is the most addictive substance with a harm score of three. Cannabis is half as addictive as even alcohol, which itself is 1.6. And in this simplified scale, cannabis is slightly less addictive than caffeine. There is, however, a slightly higher risk of dependency in adolescence. Of course, medicinal cannabis is not street cannabis. Medicinal cannabis is strictly regulated and quality controlled. The CBD products are widely sold as herbal remedies. Street cannabis is used for its intoxicating effects. So let's move on to the actions of cannabis. The endocannabinoid system is an ancient signaling system found right through invertebrates to advanced vertebrates. It's ubiquitously present in the human body, restoring homeostasis by promoting sleep, appetite, stress reduction, modulation of pain and inflammation. It regulates pleasure, memory, cognition, sensory processing and brain development. It functions through cannabis receptors, CB1 and CB2, and endocannabinoids, endogenous ligands. Now, CB1 receptors are particularly found in the brain and central nervous system, but also many other areas. But as I've already mentioned, there are none in the brainstem cardiorespiratory centers, making this such a safe medication. CB2 receptors are found in peripheral organs, especially the immune system. The system modulates or downregulates neurotransmitter chemicals, and we won't go into the details now. And like endorphins, we have endocannabinoids secreted in response to tissue injury or a presynaptic neuronal trigger, which then bind to the CB receptors to downregulate pain and inflammation. Other substances are also believed to work through the endocannabinoid system, such as the complementary medicine, PEA. Now to cannabis as a medicine. Cannabis is not a single molecule, but it's comprised of many bioactive components, perhaps over 500, including cannabinoids, of which the best known ones are CBD, cannabidiol, and THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. The relatively inactive CBDA and THCA and CBG, cannabidiol. There are also terpenes, which give cannabis its characteristic odor and flavonoids. The naturally occurring plant phytocannabinoids are initially inactive acidic forms, TC, THCA and CBDA from unfertilized female flowers. They are activated to THC and CBD by heating, which is why people traditionally smoke joints or bombs. The manufacture of medicinal cannabis involves heating the inactive compounds and extracting and of course, testing the resulting product. There are many chemical varieties of cannabis. They're not actually strains uh, and they're called chemovars. 
although the cannabinoids have most of the health benefits, the terpenes and flavonoids act in harmony. And this is the entourage effect. We know that synthetic pure THC is known to have nasty effects and pure CBD is not particularly effective for pain with even a small amount of THC greatly increasing the analgesic effect. THC mainly stimulates the CB1 receptors, thus it's psychoactive with well-known effects on pain, appetite stimulation, emotions and cognition. CBD has powerful indirect effects without stimulating either CB1 or CB2 receptors, but it also acts on other receptor symptom, systems. CBD isn't a strong analgesic, but has a variety of effects which are also beneficial in pain management, and it's not psychoactive. Cannabinoids are lipophilic, meaning they dissolve in fat with a low water solubility. Coconut oil is thus generally used as a carrier for medicinal cannabis. Absorption varies depending on the route of administration. And cannabis has a long half-life and accumulates in fatty tissues. So we need to bear this in mind during treatment. Excretion is also slow via the liver cytochrome P450 pathway. And thus cannabis is detectable in the body for a couple of weeks once it's used. By now you're probably thinking that this sounds very complex. I'll try to make it simple. Cannabis doesn't cure conditions, it alleviates symptoms to improve the quality of life. Thus, a single medication can have several effects. I'll now go through some of the practicalities of medicinal cannabis.